I always tell people that you're more capable than you think you are. You are. You are. You're, 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 be original. Don't be like the guy on the radio. Great music will prevail. So I would tell people, make great music. Don't make other people's music. Make your own. Money, money, money don't make me. So I just say, you know what? You gotta be happy in my life. Build, build your team. Look around. Figure out all these parts because you can't do it all yourself. You're gonna burn out and get tired. tired, tired, tired. Never, never burn any bridges. You never know who someone's gonna be. I must not fear. Fear is the mind killer. Welcome to the Indie Playbook presented by Focus Noise. Ad free until we sell out. Welcome back. Welcome back to a special end of the year edition with my man Gary Osdall, the producer of the new upcoming Warren G documentary, G Funk. And it's an incredible documentary. It's an incredible story. And I hope you all check it out when it comes out early next year. If you've been enjoying this show, I always ask, but please spread the word. Tell a friend if you think they'd enjoy what you're hearing. And if you think they'd get something out of it, we've really been trying to put effort into having guests that are sharing a lot of knowledge and hopefully giving you some advice that can help you out with your life. And of course, Remember to like us on Facebook, facebook.com backslash the Indie Playbook. Subscribe on the podcast app, tune in or Stitcher. And please, once again, tell a friend. But getting back to Gary Osdall, today's guest, I wanted to have him on for a couple of reasons. So he could tell you about the Warren G documentary and how he made it and everything that went into it. But also, this dude is a master at connecting the dots. I've seen him work the room. I've seen him realize what people need before they even know that they need it. And he makes the connection seamlessly and it doesn't feel forced. And I think that's really been a key ingredient to his success, just making others around him happy and being a person of value in their lives. So I'll stop talking. Let's get into this interview with Gary Osdall. So we talked about uh, going through the process of creating the G-Funk documentary, Mm -hmm. but I just wanted to get a little bit into a brief background of how you got into the industry. All right. Um, who gave you your first break? Mm-hmm. Got it. Um, yeah, moved here in 2000. Uh, got a gig working at, at CAA, uh, working for a dude named Seamus Blackley. Uh, he invented the Xbox. Um, that was kind of my first gig in entertainment. Uh, left there and went to a company called Acme where they made me an agent. <coughs> Excuse me. And then um, went over to a company... Um, uh, called William Morris before it was William Morris Endeavor uh, for another four and a half years and uh, left there and took a job working with Tyler Perry. Um, spent a year and a half in Atlanta, another year and a half here. That kind of taught me uh, physical production, uh, how to make a movie. Right. And um, kind of took that knowledge and started my own company, uh, which I've had for about seven years now. And the idea was to continue making movies, but also work with clients that I was passionate about. I met Warren, uh, Warren G at a holiday party in Beverly Hills. And, um, that was a trip, uh, a client of mine, I put him in a movie and he knew I was a big hip hop fan and said, uh, yo, do you want to go to this, uh, party that Warren G and Wayne Newton are playing at? I'm like, huh? <laughs> Perfect combination. Perfect. Um, and it was cool. It was the, I think the third time I'd actually seen Warren perform, but never in that kind of like an intimate uh, atmosphere with like maybe like a hundred people. And um, I I told him, I was like, dude, I I know part of your story. You know, I know that you're Dre's half brother and Snoop's best friend. Um, Some of your contributions to the world of hip hop um, from the chronic album, doggy style, obviously regulate. And I said, somebody has got to tell your story. I mean, it's sick. And, um, and he's like, you know, people have tried for a while, but no one's actually been able to make it happen. Um, at the time he was like, look, I have this director that I want to introduce you to. And, uh, and he's like, you know, he's this 21 year old kid named Karam Gill. And I'm like, come on, 21. And I was like, is he still in college? He's like, well, he is. He's a Chapman. I'm like, I'm not hiring a kid. Um, how did he meet him in the first place? Karam met him at a concert, I believe in Orange County. I forgot the venue. Uh, And he was taking pictures and video of the concert. And he approached Warren and was like, dude, you know, I'd love to share some of this with you. And he cut it together, sent it to Warren. And Warren's like, this is sick. 
he's like, maybe you should be my videographer and come to more shows with me. And, uh, and he did. And he basically spent almost three years on the road with Warren, hmm. uh, going from venue to venue, um, on the bus, talking about G funk, talking about his contributions. And he really got an amazing understanding, uh, so in depth, you know, also meeting all these other artists that he's performing with right? <clears throat> as to, you know, how the G funk era really went down. And so when I met with him, I was like, you know, I was kind of not worried, but wasn't sure if he was the right dude. You know, he wasn't even born when these albums came out. Right. right. So we sat down with him and his, I guess his style of putting the film together was a little unorthodox from what I'm used to, but it was very concise. Mm. And he knew the story front to back. He knew exactly what the image was of what he wanted to shoot and how to put the story together. Uh, now let's let's not get it wrong. This is Warren's story that that he elaborated to him over the years, but Karam put it together in a very cinematic way that was dope. And um, so we were uh, after meeting him. I, w- I was convinced that he was the guy. Um, he sent me a deck uh, with kind of the idea of the story that we were going to send out to financiers. And the funny thing is, he had two line items, if I remember this correctly. Uh, above the line, above the line, and the total was fifty thousand bucks. I'm like, dude, there was no. It. He thought he could get it done for fifty thousand. I mean, we probably could have, but it would have been kind of janky, right? Um, I knew right off the bat that our music budget alone, if we were going to do this properly, was going to probably be triple that. So I said, listen, let me let me take what you have, let me put together a real budget, and let me send it out to investors. Uh, we sent it out to a few guys, <coughs> excuse me. The first, uh, two dudes, um, didn't respond. And, um, one of them told me, you know, I, I, the nineties is the most irrelevant thing right now. And Warren G the, I mean, you know, he had his day back in the day, but there's, there, there's nothing about this project that resonates with me. And I said, you couldn't be even more wrong. You know, the eighties had their time. Uh, the 90s are back in a huge way. Some of the best music in the world from hip-hop to rock came out in the 90s. And um, and I said, you know, d- let, let, let's take Warren G out of the story for a second. Just look at the story itself, you know. The story is incredible. Yeah. You know, how he put two and three together. You know, how he introduced Snoop to Dre. Um, how he came up with all these different beats. And two and three, for people who don't know, is, was Snoop and Nate Dogg and Warren. Yeah. Yeah. Warren was our producer. Uh, Nate was the soulful vocalist. Yeah. Um, you know, Snoop was just the badass MC. But the three of them together, you know, they created something really special in Long Beach. And, um, you know, it took a while, according to Warren, to get Dre to really take a look and listen to it. Um, I guess the way the story really goes is there was a bachelor party. And uh, Dre invited Warren to come up and play. And I guess the DJ ran out of music. Um, L.A. Dre, who was uh, the the keyboardist for N.W.A., <clears throat> it was his party, and Dr. Dre was his best man. And uh, Warren came, Warren came up and and popped on a demo, and it was two and three, mm-hmm. and uh, it was the first time that Dre really heard what Warren was doing, but also really heard who Snoop was. Yeah, not the way it was told in Straight Outta Compton, like the real way. It was at a bachelor party, and uh, he told Warren to call Snoop. Uh, told him to come up, and um, the rest is history. Yeah. So going back a little bit, we'll get back into the nuts and bolts of the film, but when you started at CAA, was that before you were an agent? Oh, yeah. I mean, I was an assistant just learning how to roll calls and what a call sheet was and, um, you know, scheduling meetings. I mean, all the different grunt work. Uh, I got lucky because I didn't have to start off in the mailroom. Um, but it was a, it was a, it was a cool experience, you know, because yeah, nine years in the agency world, you know, teaches you a lot. It also makes you fat cause you sit at a desk a lot, but, um, <laughs> but it was, um, it was invaluable cause it, it taught me the, the business of the industry. Yeah. How do you recommend getting your foot in the door and getting a job like that? An entry level job for people who are just trying to <clears throat> get their, you know, make their way in somehow. 
Um, persistence. Um, sending out a shit ton of resumes. Uh, I got lucky too. I had a, a headhunter. Um, that was an agency called the Friedman Agency. Uh-huh. A guy named Jules. Jules Gold, I believe. Uh, that can't brand. be real. Jules Gold? Jules Gold. Wow. I swear. He should be in the rap world. That This guy was a badass because he got my first few real interviews um, in Hollywood. Huh. And because uh, I had been sending out resumes for, for a while after college. And he was the one that got me um, what originally started as a temp job at CAA, which turned into something a little more regular. And... Um, you know, that gave me my first real bit of entertainment experience that, that helped my resume and, and helped me get my next jobs. Right. So then, okay, so then you put together this budget for this, the, the film, mm-hmm. which, which is really dope, by the way. Thank you. I have to say. Um, and so you had to then go out and pitch it to financiers. What's, what was the process in terms of doing that? <clears throat> first financier, uh, no joke, uh, said I thought Warren G was dead. I was like, I was like, homie, <laughs> that's a bad start. <laughs> he's, he's touring. He's doing just fine. You know, um, the second guy I told you, um, nineties is irrelevant. Warren G is irrelevant. Right. Third guy we sent it to, and granted this is, let's call it one week after I met Karam. And after we actually talked about really putting this together with Warren, um, I sent it to a, we sent it to a guy in Cleveland, uh, Matt Carpenter, who's our, uh, our only executive producer on this. And, uh, Matt got back to us, I swear within 10 minutes. And he said, you know, I'm a massive Warren G fan. You know, my six, seven and 10 year old could rap regulate from front to back. He actually sent a video of his 10 year old rapping regulate. That's crazy. He said, you know, every Monday morning I, I talk to my employees uh, at my office and I started off playing regulate, you know, to get the people pumped. And I was like, dude, you seem to be the right guy. What are you doing this weekend? And he's like, shit, nothing. I was like, can you come out and meet Warren? He's like, I would love to. And so I, I called Warren and I was like, you know, I've got this guy named Matt. You know, he's invested into projects um, before with us. Really cool dude. Uh, former sports agent. Um now just, you know, a very successful businessman. And um, and Warren said, I'll meet with him on one condition. I was like, what's that? And he's like, you let me barbecue for him. And I'm like, well, shit, okay. <laughs> so I called Matt, and I was like, hey, listen, Warren has a requirement. And he's like, uh-oh, what? And I was like, he wants a barbecue. He's like, hell yeah. So he flew out uh, with his assistant, and um, we spent the day hanging out at my business partner's house. And literally... I mean, three hours later, he was like, look, um, he was like, I'm in, um, don't let anyone else tell the story, you know, other than you guys and Warren, you make sure that you get the story right. You know, Karam seems to be a great dude. Um, let's make a movie. And so we were financed in, um, I mean, honestly, less than two weeks, which is the quickest I've, I've gotten any movie off the ground. And we were in production, um, immediately we started with Warren first. And then we did um, <clears throat> Paul Stewart, and then we flew to, I think, Arizona ne- next and sat down with Ice-T, um, made a trip out of Dallas, sat down with uh, uh, DOC, Dion Sanders, and then the rest of them kind of came together, um, Chuck D, uh, Russell Simmons. Um, actually, no, we did Snoop way early on, too, because we knew we had to get Warren and Snoop um, as kind of really the backbones uh, for it. And then everything else kind of came together. Um, we got Wiz Khalifa out in Pittsburgh, I believe. No, we got him out of Cleveland when he was doing a show out there. Um, big boy here. Um, yeah, it was pretty awesome. When you're thinking strategically, is it important to get the big names first so you can kind of get some of the others to trickle in after that or help use that influence? I think it helped, but I don't think that was actually ever a strategy. And I'll tell you why, you know, Warren has amazing relationships with all these guys, right. you know, they're all his friends. And, um, so it was, it was very, very on the fly. Um, when I say that this movie, you know, I was one of the, what, four producers on it, even though I was a producer, I was also, well, the driver, I was, um, 
uh, I've grew up an electric guy sometimes. I was transportation. I was, um, I mean, I, we kind of did everything. That's a great point. That's what you have to do when you're putting this together yourself. It was nuts. Yeah. Because every single one of us had to wear many, many, many hats. You right. know, we didn't have the luxury of having a team, you know, to do this. You know, we had to uh, delegate it to the production crew. I mean, mainly the, the producers. So, uh, Karm, our director, could focus on directing. But, um, you know, getting the names really did help. Um, you know, calling people up and telling them that this is Warren G's thing really did help a lot. Um, Snoop coming on board really helped. Um, you know, getting Cube later on. I don't know if... I'm sure we would have gotten him through his relationship with Warren, but a lot of it, too, we just didn't know when we were going to get somebody. It would liter- literally be like, you know, Warren telling me, yo, I just talked to so-and-so last night. You got to shoot him tomorrow. I'm like, dude, I need at least a day to yeah. get my crew in order, to get all my rentals, to get everyone in place. He's like, well, we don't have a day. So I'm like, fuck. So we would drop everything and just do it. Yeah. And um, I think that's how we caught, you know, a lot of uh, magic. What was the biggest hurdle in the process and how did you get through that? <clears throat> In the actual production process? Just or? in the whole process of making this film from A to Z. Delivery. <laughs> yeah. Um, I've always said it's it's hard getting a movie, first of all, funded and off the ground. Yeah. Shooting the movie is the easiest part um, for me. Finishing a movie is the toughest part. Uh, and actually delivering it to a distributor is... Um, is tough, you know, because there's a lot of legal that you have to go through. Uh, we had approximately 50 songs that we needed to clear. Uh, luckily, we had the best uh, music uh, supervisor and supervision team um, that we could get. They were actually our first uh, crew members that we locked in. Uh, Joel uh, C. High, uh, who I met when, when I was working with Tyler Perry and, um, and his colleague Adele Ho, uh, the two of them together um, were unbelievable. I mean, we, we could not have made this movie without those two. Um, but the biggest hurdle, I think, is, is you know, dealing with the, the legal, dealing with clearances. Um, that was not only uh, time-consuming, but um, expensive. Yeah. Um, you know, it cost a lot more money than we actually expected at the end of the day. But we wanted to make sure that we didn't want to do it cheesy. We want we wanted to make sure that it was dope. Yeah. And um, so yeah, I think that. And um, I mean, other than that, uh, you know, kind of any movie that you make, I think you have to go into it um, with no ego. And our crew, <laughs> Karam. Um, was our director, was 21 when we hired him. He was still uh, at Chapman College. We had an entire crew of kids. And when I mean kids, there was nobody older than 23 years old. Wow. And honestly, I was kind of worried because I'm like, shit, these guys have really never made a movie. I mean, they're college students. Sure, they're film majors, but they haven't made a movie. It, it, couldn't, it was the biggest blessing in disguise because... A, um, you know, instead of booking hotel rooms, they're like, "Yay, you know, let's 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 book a mansion, Airbnb a mansion somewhere, you know, with the with the dope pool." I was like, "Hell yeah!" It just saved a bunch of money, and we could double this as locations, right? Instead of a bunch of plane trips, I was like, "Hey guys, you want to go on a road trip?" Like, "Hell yeah, road trip!" <laughs> you know, instead of like you know some badass catering that we're spending an arm and a leg for, I was like, "Pizza?" And they're like, "Fuck yeah!" You know, I was like, "You want me to barbecue a ton of shit?" They're like, "Hell yeah!" You know, so it um. All those little things, like, saved us money, but it was cool, yeah. you know, because everyone we were working with was just down, you know, and no one no one complained, no one bitched. Um, it was just a very kind of symbiotic experience, and, and that's rare, too, when you make movies, because there's always somebody with some kind of ego, or right. that has some kind of fucking issue, yeah. you know, and nobody, nobody on our side did. 
Well, and I like the story with Karam too, just the idea of him just kind of creating his own position there. I mean, yeah. he took the initiative, he went up to Warren and he made it happen. And, you know, a lot of people I think of that age might have an idea that, you know, the imposter syndrome type of feeling like they don't belong because they haven't went out and done it. But, right. you know, they could be just as creative as anyone else. And, and sometimes not having that experience can actually allow you to be more creative because you don't know what you can't do at right. that point. He, um, but also, too, like, this was his feature film debut. Yeah. And, um, you know, for somebody who's never made a movie to have creatively put it together. Now, let me make this clear. This is 100% Warren G's story, you know, but to put this together in a cinematic way with the different clips, uh, the choice of music, the way it was edited, that's all Karm. Yeah. You know, and you could fuck that shit up real easy. And for a first time director, now don't get me wrong, he had a, he'd been doing this in college and he also had a creative agency. He was directing a lot of, uh, music videos for he directed one of Warren's music videos. He's done all of Marshmallow's stuff now. Mm. Um, you know he's dope, but realistically, it's just you could fuck it up easy. Yeah. And um, were we worried? I guess, but I think we just knew that he understood the story so well that we just trusted him and um, and trusted him in the process. And could you take us through the process of shopping it to different distributors and kind of the advantages and disadvantages of different platforms you come across? Yeah, we, um, so the way I've always done things and I feel what works best for me as a salesperson is I try to always find who is, um, who's going to gravitate to something like I wouldn't send this to, let's say a, a 60 year old you know, Caucasian agent at some big agency because they probably wouldn't resonate with this time period. Yeah. They wouldn't get what G-Funk was. They weren't like, you know, I'm 40, you know, having grown up through the 90s in high school. I mean, this was like my shit. Yeah. Um, so I really wanted to find somebody that responded to that. Um, I worked with a guy uh, at William Morris. His name was Nico Gioni, uh, who's now an agent at CAA. And uh, and I called him up and I was like, dude, I made this uh, documentary about the G-Funk era. He's like, no shit. He's like, I fucking love that music. He's a massive hip-hop fan. I was like, I know. Uh, if you know Nick, if he wasn't an agent, he'd be at a concert. Right. He's just a big music head. And I, I, I said, listen, you know, it's still a rough cut and I, I want you to check it out. Not only did he check it out, but I think he, he called me, I think it was the next day. And he quoted the movie for almost 10 minutes and like kept me on the phone and was like, dude, in this part, and I can't believe you open with summertime in the LBC and holy shit, this part, I had no idea this happened. He's like, what the fuck? And, um, and I was like, so you like it? He's like, dude, I love it. And he's like, I'm going to sell this film. And I was like, cool, you should meet my producing partners. He wanted to meet Warren and I took him to a Warren show and, and, um, introduced him to, uh, you know, Snoop and corrupt and, and um, and that was it. So yeah. that's how we got CAA on board uh, to sell the film. And uh, strategically, we decided that uh, South by Southwest would probably be our, our best. Um, it just seemed like a perfect fit. Music yeah. doc. Um, but also, it was like within our window of time. And uh, we submitted and, um, you know, creative artists really pushed and... Um, we got in from the day, honestly, it, from the day that Warren and I started talking about the project until the day that we were accepted into South by was almost nine months to the day. And if you know, timelines of how a movie is made, that's a miracle. Right. And especially if you know what it's like working with hip hop artists, that's even more of a miracle. That's yeah. incredible. Yeah. And, and, uh, yeah, uh, there you have it. And, so to answer your question about distributors, we um, we also hired a um, an amazing publicist, uh, Sunshine Sachs. Um, our team over there uh, was incredible. Um, I mean, we had Brooke Blumberg here in L.A. and Tiffany Malloy um, in in New York. Um, 
Isabel um, was also uh, from New York. She she came out uh, to South by. They set up a lot of um, pre press. We did some phoners. We did um, a couple of magazines just to kind of leak the story out there and to get it out so people knew that this movie was coming to South by. And then after that, the day before we got into South by Southwest, uh, I mean that's when they really, I mean completely dropped the bomb. We're like, oh shit. Because they got us into, you know, all the music trades and all the the big uh, movie trades. So Variety, Hollywood Reporter, Variety gave us, I mean, just the most amazing review. Uh, Hollywood Reporter, um, you know, called us like one of the top five uh, films to watch at uh, South by Southwest. Um, Billboard magazine um, called us one of the buzziest movies of the festival. Um, uh, Rolling Stone uh, wrote just an incredible write-up on us. And so we went in really strong. We didn't expect the kind of um, response that we would get. I thought we would have time to do shit, yeah. see other movies, enjoy other events. But, I mean, we were literally Team G-Funk. Uh, from the moment we landed, we were the hip-hop house. Uh, don't get me wrong, we partied, yeah. you know, but it was um, mostly at the house. And it was literally going from one press thing to another, and and everyone was just talking about this movie, G Funk, G Funk, G Funk. Oh, you guys are the G Funk guys, you know. And um, I mean, we were shocked. Um, all of our screenings uh, not only had an incredible showing. Our final screening, I, I think it sold out for, I don't know how many people the theater sold, but it was like six hundred people, and we had to turn away. I think almost one hundred and fifty. Yeah. Um, we had a few people that that saw it uh, two, if not three times. Uh, the Q and A sessions were always very smart and intelligent. I mean, people that were very informed, and and that's when the calls started coming in from uh, distributors, and um, and so we had a lot of sit downs with our agent Nick, and he said, "So this has come in, and and that's come in, and you guys should consider this," and and um, I mean, it was a uh, it was a whirlwind. Yeah. You know? Sounds like it. Yeah. Um, you've mentioned a couple of times now introducing Warren to a couple people that that turned the tide. And it, it it just reminded me there's a there's a quote by Einstein that something like, Try not to become a man of success, but to become a man of value. And I think one thing that you're really good at is connecting the dots between people and figuring out like what someone wants before they even know they want it. Right. And you make that connection. So you, you know, this person's a fan of this show and this person's a fan of this show and you connect them. Right. Is that a skill that you were born with or did you acquire that? Did you just kind of figure it out? How, how did that come about? I learned kind of really quick, uh, quickly that, um, you know, connecting good people, you just never know what could possibly grow out of it. And then once you, you know, start growing your your network of entertainment folks, and you find out, okay, well, this dude makes movies, but he is big time in a in a music. You know, I think it would be pretty dope if you introduce him to, you know, whomever. Right. Um. So, I guess to answer your question, I mean, yeah. Um. For me, I I, I learned real quick. You know especially when you're like raising money for a movie. The worst thing for me to do is, or for anyone to do, I think for that matter is to sit down and be like, well, this is our plan, you know, and this is our waterfall and this is how we're projecting to make money. And this is what we're going to do to make money because the investor really doesn't give a shit. You know, they have the money. Yeah. They want, first of all, they're mostly investing into you and, but they're also investing into the project. So what I find that the coolest way to find new business and to collaborate with new people um, is a you find out what their interests are and you put them together in a very unpretentious cool setting you know sure you could talk business for a few minutes you know and say I'm working on this and you know you guys should talk about this but the rest of the time is just hanging out right and really getting to know that person because at the end of the day you know, the creative process, if you're going to, what, spend like a month and a half making a movie, you want to make it with people that you dig. And um, so that's really it. Um, the connecting dots, I think it just, I guess, comes naturally. It's, for me, it's fun. Yeah. 
um, and just finding out what, you know, turns on other people and gets them excited. And so obviously you've worked with a bunch of investors and a bunch of successful people. Who's the first person that comes to mind when you think of successful people that you've worked with and what attributes do they have that you admire? Hmm. Um, that's an interesting one. Um, I guess one of the most favorite people I've worked with. Okay. Well, actually let me rewind here a second. Tyler Perry. Um, I, I have to give him props because I work for him directly with him. Yeah. You know, almost every single day for a year and a half in Atlanta and that dude. Wow. I mean, let me tell you, he is, he's incredible. Um, I've literally seen him, you know, out doing press while he's directing a TV show and a movie on two separate computers simultaneously at the same time. <laughs> and I mean, that, that shit's insane. Yeah. When I used to work for him, you know, we would shoot almost two television shows per day. Now, if you know, in, in the real world, you know, that's not how it happens. TV shows usually shot in eight to 10 days. Um, Soap operas, they could shoot two to three a day. Yeah. You know, he's shooting full on episodic television, two episodes a day. And I thought that was incredible at the time until I spoke with some of the people that are working with him now. They're like, damn, you're from the cave days. I'm like, what do you mean? They're like, we don't do table reads anymore. We we shoot like 10, or not 10, like five episodes a day. I'm like, how could you do that? <laughs> you know, and his movies too. Like he, he knocks those things out. So, you know, it's just if you have a vision and seeing that man who is one of the most visionary people that I've ever had the opportunity to be around is just incredible. But his work ethic is so strong. His creative vision is so strong, but he also knows too that, you know, when you work hard, you also have to play and rest hard, you know, because if you don't clean your mind out, I mean, what's the point? It's just, I guess, regurgitating the same shit. But so he taught me a lot of valuable lessons and also to really trust in what you're doing 100%. I remember uh, we had a conversation about um, trusting yourself and being 100% about something or not doing it at all. And, and it was kind of profound to me because, you know, certain things I'm not 100% sure of, but you do it anyways. And you make a mistake, and you learn from that. But now I've just learned to follow my passion um, uh, basically from watching him. I guess my favorite person that I've worked with uh, is probably Craig Robinson. Um, he's also one of the funniest people I've ever met in person. Just because he's such a cool fucking yeah, dude. Yeah, he's very down to earth. But he's, he's, he's down to earth. He's humble. He's funny. He's a, a good communicator. Um He's just he's just a genuinely great person, you know. Yeah. And um, and Craig, I'd love to make another movie with you, man. But um, I mean, you know, people like that, um, you know, give you inspiration, and um, you know, I mean, really kind of solidify the fact of what you know we're doing, what I'm doing, you know, really makes sense. I have a funny Craig Robinson story. I don't even know if I should share this, but it was it was so <laughs> ridiculous. Uh, we're sitting in the green room. We were doing a benefit for uh, Rain Wilson's charity, Lide, and uh, it was it was Creed and myself and and a couple other friends. Uh, my guy Kale, who's a who's a director, and it was just really quiet in there. No one's saying anything, and all of a sudden, Craig turns to us and goes, "Any of you ever jerk off to The Walking Dead?" <laughs> Sounds Maybe the right. best icebreaker I've ever heard. But. Sounds about right. Yeah. But no, Craig's hilarious. Uh, so I'm sure you've heard the saying that you're an average of the five people you spend the most time with. Who are the five people in your life? Um, the five people I spend the most time with. Well, my girlfriend, uh, Jamie Beebe, uh, who is a casting director. She's very lovely. Um, would be number one on that list. Uh, number two, um, would probably be, uh, my colleague and first friend in LA, uh, Mark Stevens, um, who now said, who now works for me, um, <laughs> whether he likes it or not, but <laughs> yeah, uh, that's number two. 
Uh, number three would probably be my uh, business partner, Rafael Chavez. Um, we met at uh, a DUI penalty course in Santa Barbara when we were in college. Um, that was fun. Um, I guess next on that list um, is uh, my buddy Brian Vavana, um, who we both started off um, uh, early in our careers as, as agents, and we both ended up moving over to the William Morris Agency. Um, he's a writer, fantastic writer, and um, you know, just an all-around good dude. And who? Who's, number five is my dog, Cabo. So all, all the people excluding your dog are in the industry, um, pretty much. Yes. So how important is it to surround yourself with people who inspire you? I mean, it's everything. Um, every year that I look down uh, the table for like my birthday dinner, I realize you know my my friends are kind of um kind of a mix of both. Uh, personal friends, but so many clients now, um, who I've grown these amazing relationships with both on the business and personal side. And that to me is everything, man, because most of my clients are people that I have, um, been a fan of, um, or that I admire their work. Um, it's, it's, it's very important. Yeah. And I, I love people who are super multifaceted when people come up and say I'm a writer, actor, director, producer, I'm like, fuck yeah, dude, that's, that's dope. Because if you're just, if you're just an actor and you're sitting around, you're waiting for the next job to happen, you're a sucker. You know, you have to go out and hit the pavement. You have to go out, write, write your own script, make your own movie, um, direct something. You know, the arts is, is very cyclical. There's so many highs and lows and ups and downs and all the rounds. And, and you gotta, you gotta enjoy those, those moments, you know, when, when you're peaking and you're making money and you're doing well and everything's going, you know, successful, you got to, you got to tell yourself and check yourself and tell yourself that, you know what, dude, you're going to go back down and hit a valley eventually. And when you do hit that valley, hopefully it makes you stronger and, and you learn how to get out of it quicker so you can get back up to that peak again. But no matter what you do in this career, it's, it's always going to be highs and lows. And the quicker you realize that, I think the the more success you're going to have, but the more people that you surround yourself with that are passionate about what they do, I think true. Um, I, I like working with artists, you know, and it doesn't even matter what your medium of art is. As long as you're passionate about doing something, that's the shit. And like, for me, I think LA is dope because it's just a big melting pot of dreamers. You know, yeah. And if you're constantly going out there and trying to attain that dream, you know, I, I, I don't think there's anything cooler. And how, how do you handle the peaks and valleys, especially running your own business? It can be lucrative at times, and then there can be down times. How do you get through that? I mean, persistence. Um, look, January, February for my industry. Um, uh, which is management, mostly actors, um, few writers, director. Um, you know, January, February, slow. And if you're not prepared for that, I mean, it's going to be tough. How do I prepare? Um, I, I guess just growing up with age and learning how to, I guess, save and not be an asshole with your money. Yeah. Um, but also just being... You know, just just pushing because the, the more you pick up the phone, the mal the more outgoing calls that you make. Um, I I learned well, I heard that yesterday from um, an amazing producer, Brian Metavoy, that I sat down with. You know, I'm not in the incoming call business. Yeah, I can't just wait for my fucking phone to ring. You know, I have to pick that shit up and make shit happen. And um, I mean, it's just planting seeds. Not everything grows, you know, but um, a lot of shit does. Yeah. Could you take us back to a rock bottom time where you considered quitting the business and, and how you got through that? What did you do to push through? I've never, um, ever once considered leaving the business. Um, when I started off, I figured I would give it 
let's call it five years at first. I wasn't exactly sure what I was going to do. But I told myself, if I don't make it in entertainment, I'm moving back to San Diego where I'm from. I'm going to get a job at the San Diego Padres, my favorite baseball team. And I'm going to figure out a way to become the general manager of the team. So it was either entertainment or baseball. Um, luckily, I'm too stubborn to, to give up. And, man, I've had some 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 lows, you know, where I wasn't making shit. And I was working for you know, a crazy person who wanted to yell all day or um, – and especially going independent. I mean, that shit was tough, man, because now no one's giving you a, a regular paycheck. Yeah. And now you got to go out and, and figure it out on your own. And there ain't nobody telling me what, what to do is right or wrong. It's just I have to do it from my own experience. So low times are, are tough. But, you know, like I said earlier, you got you to gotta learn how to take that experience and... Um, and uh and and really learn how to it makes you stronger it just it, it teaches you how to to struggle and and hustle more you know to get to get your next book yeah i think experience makes you appreciate that oh yeah um do you have anything that you do to start the day that helps your productivity that just gets you kick started coffee coffee and that's it <laughs> how many cups um, a day oh i don't even know anymore i used to <laughs> Uh, the William Morris Agency used to get cases and cases of Rockstar, and I got on a really bad Rockstar kick where I was literally drinking probably like four to, I don't know, eight a day. Who knows? I, I, I lost count with coffee. Um, so I would come home more strung out and wired um, than, than I was at the office. And then I learned that's probably not good for your health, so I just switched to Rockstar, which is probably just as stupid, and I was drinking <laughs> two to four of those a day. And then I finally, well, not finally, I still do the rock star trip, but I'm trying to lay back on the coffee and be a little more mellow. Um, but really, to get my day started, um, you know, I want to wake up with a clear head and um, and and kind of be very, um, not zen, I don't meditate, but, you know, spend some time with my dogs and and um, and chill and, and, and come in and, and start the day strong you know usually around 9 nine thirty. yeah I, I did the same thing with rockstar when i dj'd i would drink that shit like crazy and i ended up actually Bad. passing out and going to the hospital one night after oh, a show shit. so yeah stay away from that shit yeah uh so how often you set goals and and do you check in on those is that something you do frequently oh yeah um i think it's always good to have i mean for me i want to know Hopefully every year is better than the next. Um, and that's, I think, my my shortest-term goal. Yes, short-term goals as far as what I want to accomplish in a month, two months. Sometimes it's a little hard to um, pinpoint a lot of those, especially with um, development and, um, and and doing what I do. But, yes, um, I, I had a five- and a ten-year goal, and... Um, you know, I wanted to be a, a working manager producer and I've, I've attained that. And, and, um, you know, I've made, uh, uh, a bunch of movies in the, the, you know, let's call it the million dollar range. And, and I want to get out of that and do higher budgets. And we're starting to do that. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm starting to rep much more, I don't want to say better, but, um, I guess bigger actors, yeah. um, and bigger projects. And I constantly want to, um, you know, know what the next, doesn't have to be the big thing, but what the next ins inspiring thing is. But I, I definitely want to keep moving forward and moving up and uh, doing bigger and better. What's one tool aside from your phone or laptop that you couldn't live without? One tool beside my phone or laptop I couldn't live without. Um, oh, my Sonos system. Oh yeah, can't I live without Sonos. Sonos, dude. Yeah, I used to have speakers in my house. Remember back in the day, you would you would stick your um your iPhone inside of a cup. Yeah, you know, so it'd make like a speaker, and that was like dope. You're like, dude, it sounds so much better than just the iPhone. And then I got these uh uh those um uh, speaker uh fucking what are those called speaker lights. So I changed all the outlets of my light to speaker lights, and they also like change colors, so you could change your entire house into blue, and then all your 
your lights would be speakers, and that shit was dope. And then I got Sonos. <laughs> shit, dude. Blows it away, huh? That shit's insane. Yeah. A lot of times, uh, I think people have issues when they have a big task that's in front of them, and you know they they don't even know where to start. You know they they don't know even how to take step one. So what do you do when you're faced with the daunting task that scares you? How do you go about it? I mean, I love that shit. Um, I love anything that is kind of scary because I want to overcome any fear. I still can't get over the fear of sharks, and I tried surfing to do that, but fuck that shit, man. I don't want to get eaten. Do you really need to get over that fear, though? I think I do. Is that important? Eventually, I want to get dropped in a cage with sharks. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and and maybe even free dive with sharks one day just so I could finally get over that shit. But if I'm faced with a daunting task, I, I don't know. It's just breaking it down and figuring out how to do it. But also um, asking for advice uh, from other people who have gone through that before and seeing how they dealt with it. Um, one thing I'm not afraid to do anymore is, is, is ask people, yo, I mean, like, what did you do when you had this type of experience, you know? Or like, how did you deal with you know, this and, and, and it's, it's great to have mentors around you that, that know shit that I don't. Cause I mean, look, every year I'm learning, um, you know, you, you learn new shit and you feel like you, you become proficient at something, but there's a shit ton of stuff that you don't know. And, and it's, you know, thank God I have people around me that, um, can help me guide through those situations. Okay, cool. Uh, I just have a couple of quick questions yeah, at sure. the end that we end it with. Uh, knowing everything you know now, do you feel like following your passion is good advice? 100%. I think life is pointless if you're not following your passion. Um, I mean, nothing against my, my friends back home in San Diego. Um, but, you know, if I guess if I had a wife and kids, it would be a little different because I would have to have something a little more regular. Um, but for me... Fuck that. I, I can't do anything that I'm not passionate about because if, if it doesn't drive you, why do it? Yeah. You know, I don't think there's any point. What did your 21-year-old self do that you wouldn't be caught dead doing now? Oh, wow. My 21-year-old self was a dumbass. Um, drinking and driving. <laughs> mm. I mean, I, I honestly, like, I was a stupid kid, but I got a DUI when I was 21. And then literally, I, I don't know why I'm putting this out there for people to know, but um, I got a second from the same cop in the same month, but I only had two beers in my system. But he was a dick. Officer Scott Clacking of the Santa Barbara Police Department, dick. Um, and uh, he literally, I mean, he had it out for me, and he gave me a second one because I had two beers in my system. And man, thank God for Uber and Lyft because yeah. I ain't ever doing that shit again, ever, ever, ever. Well, it did. It did uh, lead to you meeting your business partner, so something good true. came out of it. That was dope. I, I did the same thing, and I wonder now, coming up, if twenty-one-year-olds are taking Uber and Lyft. Like, I would be disappointed if they weren't, because we didn't have that op that option. Now it's there. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm a I'm a massive advocate. It's it's a lot easier having somebody else drive than than spending thirty five grand and a couple of nights in jail. Fuck that. Yeah, keep that in mind. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, what did you think you couldn't live without, but now realize wasn't so important in your life? I don't know. Um, I guess living by the beach. I grew up by the beach, and now I'd rather just go visit some tropical beach somewhere. Um, honestly, hmm, that's a tough one. I don't know. All right, we can well. move on. Uh, if an evil dictator took over the world and banned all art, but allowed each person to keep one album and one book, what would you choose? Isn't that happening right now? It is. That's why I'm asking. Fucking dick. Um, this started out as a <laughs> hypothetical question, but as we are going along through this podcast, it seems to be happening. I would keep either The Catcher in the Rye or The Godfather as a book. Love those. I, I could read either one of those anytime over and over and still get something new out of it. Probably Goodfellas or American Psycho as a movie. Um, and then what was uh, the third one? Album. Ooh. I mean, there's too many. Um, appetite for Destruction. <laughs> I go. mean, there's so many, but um, 
yeah, hopefully I could just grab my my uh, my iTunes and take off. <laughs> uh, if you could send a 280 character tweet that everyone in the world would see, what would it say? Wow. Um, fuck you, Donald Trump. Um, I don't know. Follow your passion. I love that. Uh, so last question, what excites you most going into 2018? <clears throat> There's a lot of shit. Um, 2017 was the best year I've ever had independently. Uh, I met some of the best people. Um, I worked on projects that I'm the most proud of. Um, and I feel like I laid a lot of groundwork, um, for shit that's going to happen in 2018 not only with projects, um, but with people and relationships. And, uh, I mean, as you know, I'm very excited about, um, this new partnership of, uh, these amazing creative, um, you know, badasses. I mean, all of us have our different skill sets, but combining those and utilizing all of our resources, um, together, I think is the most exciting thing for me. I mean, I just see so much opportunity in the areas of places in the business that you work in, right. you know, that you may not necessarily see that you could potentially monetize or do something with on my side and, you know, doing that with five other dudes who also have other resources and that, you know, are, are Kings in their own rights in their own, in their own fields. Yeah. Um, that to me is exhilarating as fuck, man. That's exciting. Yeah, it's it's cool. One one quick note to add to that is just how much all of us in our own lives have had to kind of weed through people that we've had to carry and put on our backs. And, you know, eventually, like the people who are willing to keep working and persist and not give up and keep going are going to end up meeting like minded people who have the same visions and same goals and same drive. So that's that's another point to keep in mind. If you feel like you're dragging friends along who don't really want to be there or they just want to give in to them, they're probably not the people you need to surround yourself with. Absolutely. Work with people that are just as passionate, if not more than you, and learn from them. Yeah. And that are doing other things that you're doing because it, it challenges you to learn more. Yep, exactly. Uh, where can people find you online? Um, well, uh, at Gary Osdall, G-A-R-Y-O-U-S-D-A-H-L. Uh, that's me on Twitter, uh, and Facebook. Um, I'm also at Gary O, uh, seven, seven on Instagram. And my company is at, at advanced MGMT LA. Uh, that's about it. And for people who are interested, when and where can they see the G funk documentary? You're going to see G funk in 2018. Um, a couple of things had to, uh, pushes back to 2018 clearances, but I mean we've we're, we've got that all figured out. Uh, we've already started uh, looking into our marketing. You're going to start seeing billboards uh, in and around LA and outside of LA. Uh, I can't give you an exact date yet because I don't even know the exact date. But um, it's going to be in the first quarter of 2018, and uh, I hope you all dig it because uh, it's a dope movie. You will for sure. Appreciate it. Thanks, Gary. You got it, brother. Thank you. All right. Thanks again for tuning in to the Indie Playbook presented by Focus Noise. And once again, if you've been enjoying what you heard, please tell a friend that's the best thing you could do. We really want to spread the word. And I hope you have a good end of the year. We'll catch you at the top of 2018. Till next year, peace.